Romans 8, 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Father, thank you so much for your truth. Thank you that we've been able to sing to your praises this morning. And our desire is your pleasure, that you will take delight in us as your redeemed people and that our worship is acceptable. And we praise you that we can offer all we do through uh, the glorious truth that Jesus Christ is our advocate, our high priest. And Father, as we look into your word now, we pray that Christ would be elevated, uh, that we would have ears to hear, that we'd be attentive to uh, your spirit and his word. And Father, you would change us, all of us. For some, it may be under new birth, that they hadn't yet come to understand you know, what it means to be born again and adopted into the family of God. And Lord, for your children who have may lost the, the wonder or the awe of the gospel, of the privilege of being in the family of God, perhaps first love has waned. Lord, would you please uh, ignite the fire if need be as we look across at our nation and we see the con continual spiraling down to death. We ask that you'd revive, renew, send awakenings to your church and that we would be the recipients of the mercy of God upon a nation that is so godless. And we thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. And we're back in Romans and um, I, I want to do just a, a flyby, kind of a, a a 30,000 view, because it helps us. It helps us to keep the context, and we need to do that as we work our way through this wonderful, wonderful letter. Uh, this, this letter, Romans, it is the most logical of Paul's, uh, of all of his. Uh, his arguments are profound as he works through. As you start in the very beginning it, of Romans 1, chapter 1 through 17, it's a greeting, but there's something else. There is a thesis statement. In verse 17, where he would say that the righteous or the just shall live by faith, that was the battle cry of the Reformation. It also is the very thesis of Romans. It all flows from that very statement. That's Romans 1, 1 through 17. And then Paul will, as a surgeon, as a spiritual surgeon, he will begin in verse 18 of chapter 1, all the way through to chapter 3, verse 20. He will bring condemnation up all, upon all humanity. The Jew and the Gentile, no one uh, will be left aside. Everyone will be brought to the bar of God's justice, and they will all fail. And so he brings everybody into this state of condemnation, which the purpose of that is to bring, um, bring all people, uh, Jew and Gentile alike, to their need for a righteousness that's not their own. And then in verse, chapter 3, verse 21, through chapter 4, verse 25, we have the glorious doctrine of justification by faith, illustrated uh, by the father of faith, and that would be Abraham. In chapter 5, we have the uh, identification of the two humanities. We have those who are in Adam, which is every one of us uh, by birth, and then we have those who are in Christ, which is the recipient of saving grace. So the two humanities are separated and that simplifies when we see the world today and all the chaos that's going on, uh, we shouldn't be surprised because what we have is we have those in Adam who are acting out the Adamic nature, which the world is in chaos because of sin. It's because of rebellion against God. And then we see those in Christ and the radical transformation uh, that we would recognize as new birth. And then in Romans 6, 7, and 8, and that's a unit that you need to read together because that, that really defines for us the, the application of the doctrine, the application of the doctrine found in the earlier chapters of Romans. In Romans chapter 6, we get our union with Christ, and I'll mention more about that in a minute. And then in Romans 7, we have the stark reality of the Christian life. We have the ups and downs that uh, there's times that we look in a mirror and we don't even understand ourselves. And that's what Paul would say. 
And then we come into the light of Romans 8. The dark tunnel of Romans 7, it starts to give way to Romans 8, which is one of the most detailed uh, portions of Scripture on the working of the Spirit in the believer. And that's where we find ourselves in Romans chapter 8, life in the Spirit. And the thesis statement in Romans chapter 8 is in verse 1, where he would say, there is therefore, going all the way back to what he's just said about our union in Christ, the, uh, the messiness of the Christian life, he says, in light of all of that, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And that is a breath of fresh air coming out of Romans 7 is that when you understand that Romans 7 doesn't define your position, it certainly defines your, um, your experience as a Christian, the side of heaven. But in Romans chapter 8, Paul would say, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And then from verse 1 all the way through to the end of it, he would uh, unfold what is known as the great assurance chapter of the, bo of the book. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It is assurance. It is our assurance. But yet Paul would say that there's much more to that. And he begins to unfold in chapter 8, which we find ourselves now for uh, multiple weeks in this great chapter of assurance. Now, as we work our way through chapter 8, you'll see in your outline, I, I just put it there just for your reminder. It's, it's, it's a hard chapter to outline, but nevertheless, it is a chapter of assurance. And if you're struggling in assurance, if you're struggling for assurance of your salvation, if you're struggling uh, for uh, your position in Christ, you're not sure, am I in what? Chapter 8 of Romans is an excellent place to anchor your soul, to draw from the, uh, the deep well of the riches of assurance. And we've discovered there's seven treasures in chapter 8 that are working our way through. And today we start the third one. We've already gone through verses 1 through 4, our position in Christ, no condemnation. Uh, verses 5 through 13, which is the, the longest portion, it is a detailed working of the Spirit of God, the empowering presence of the Spirit of God. And then today, verses 14 through 17, we open up the third treasure in this treasure chest, and that is our adoption, our adoption. And uh, that'll take us a few weeks to cover that. And then we'll work our way as the Lord allows uh, through the rest of chapter 8. And so, as now, we are now unlocking this, as I said. We just read Romans 8, 14 through 17. Now, what we see there is if you read Romans 6 and you read Romans 8, you're going to find a lot of parallels. You're going to find a lot. In fact, Romans 8 uh, does a good exposition of Romans 6. Romans 6 talks about the use of the mind. It talks about our union in Christ. And then in Romans 8, uh, Paul would talk about who is the agent of all that happening, and he talks about the Spirit of God. And so you have a complementary uh, chapter in Romans 7 is in the middle of that. So you've got this sandwich of joy mixed with the not pleasantries of Romans 7. But as we look at this in, in Romans chapter 8, uh, we have unfolding for us one of the most neglected doctrines that is being taught in the church today. I know it's a bold statement to say, I'm not alone in saying that. And that is the doctrine of adoption. What does it mean to be in the family of God? And there's a lot of exhortation about what it means to be a Christian, how we are to walk as a Christian. And those are right. that We've done that and we will do that. But there's two, there's two doctrines that we need to understand and we need to apply because that is what applied theology is supposed to do. It's supposed to inform us how to live the Christian life. And it's not based on a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's based in chapter 6, our union in Christ. And it's based in chapter 8, our adoption in the family of God. Those two doctrines are the foundational truths of assurance. It's my union in Christ in chapter 6, my union in his death, and my union in his resurrection that causes no condemnation because that's an inseparable union. And that's not based on my good performance or my bad performance as a Christian. Uh, you could not read your Bible for a few days and you feel the accusation and you feel the guilt that doesn't change your union in Christ. Or you could be diligent in your Bible and you could be diligent in sharing the gospel and your good performance, if there is such a, a thing as a Christian, doesn't enhance your union in Christ. We are in him, and that is one of the great prayers, a portion of Jesus' high priestly prayer is the union that we have. When he prays that, Father, as we are one, that they would be one also in us. 
There's a language of intimacy. There's a language uh, of union that goes beyond just the theological truth that I, in Christ, it is, it is in Christ that produces the joyful Christian life. It, it produces the, the confidence as a Christian. And then in Romans chapter 8, the other neglected doctrine is that of adoption. Is that of adoption. Sinclair Ferguson he said this, quote, the Christian church in general has not always maintained this fresh and living sense of the fatherhood of God. It has often failed to appreciate that the Christian life is a life of sonship, end quote. Now, this section that we're looking at, verses 14 through 17, it is rich. It is extremely rich. It is one of those sections that you can anchor yourself and you can put yourself in and just study that and study that and pray through that to understand the depth of what Paul is telling us. He, under, he unfolds some of the ministry of the Spirit of God. He unfolds for us what it means to be in the family of God. He destroys any th thoughts of religiosity and it actually produces the right type of relationship with God. Think about it for a minute. If you're a Christian today, you have a natural impulse in you to pray. That is part of the new birth. You have a natural impulse to pray. When that impulse is absent, one of two things are, are occurring. Number one, you're either not a Christian, or number two, you are a drifting Christian. And so when you look at the, uh, what Paul's saying, and he will say this throughout his letters, is this understand of the fatherhood of God is so critical in regards to the Christian life. There are times in your life that you are going to be under the heavy burdens of life. It could be job. It could be marriage. It could be family relationships. It could be just a host of different things. And we all felt that. We feel the weight of that upon us. And there are times, like when you read in the Psalms, where David is so overwhelmed that the breakers are coming over us. And there are times that you have this impulse to pray, but you don't even know what to pray that your heart is crushed, that the circumstances seem overwhelming, and we'll talk more in chapter 8 about the Spirit helping us pray. But there are times that all you can do is cry out to God in one word, and that is Father. Father. The most comforting of comforts is that you're able to call the Creator the holy, 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 unapproachable creator. You're able to come to him, Abba, Father. You're able to come to him with a cry of intimacy because you have that union in Christ which makes him your father. And now we have this adoption, this adoption. And I do pray that this encourages you, that you understand more and more what it means to be a child of God and that you recognize the Spirit's leading in your life. As I said, this is a very rich uh, section, and uh, th there's always a temptation to begin a series in a series, and I don't want to do that because we could spend a couple months on, uh, on these verses, on adoption. In fact, there are books, there are books that are a pretty good-sized book on the adoption of what it means to be adopted as a family of God. And that's, that, to our, to our gain, is a recent thing. There hasn't been a whole lot written in the last hundred years on adoption. But we're going to refrain from that, and we're going to look at this uh, from a family perspective. As we move into verses 8 through 14, I'm sorry, chapter 8, 14 through 17, we're going to identify two works of the Spirit which are unfolded in this section, which provide for us the headings, and then we'll bore down uh, as, as we have time and the Spirit allows us to do so. The first thing is in verse 14, we want to look at the Spirit's leadership of the believer, the Spirit's leadership of the believer. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now, there is a lot of stuff about that. I'm being led by the Spirit. So if I was to ask you, you know, and you say to me, uh, I'm being led by the Spirit, and I would say, well, what does that look like? What would you say? Now, there are some places you can go. You, you, it's, it's, it's defined by some inward experience. It's defined by some external uh, manifestation of the, of the Spirit. We need to be very careful that we don't subjectively try to de de describe or define or, or uh, expound what we think it says, but actually let the Scripture speak for itself what it actually says. And so when you think about that, uh, it's easy for all who are led by the Spirit. Well, how, does that, how do you know? Where is He leading you? What does that look like in the, practical, the practicality of the Christian life? 
And then in verses 15 through 17, uh, we want to look at from his leadership to his witness. In verse 15, we have the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, and the Spirit. And note the word himself in verse 16, bears witness. And so we want to look at what that witness is in regards to our adoption. So the first thing we want to note then is the Spirit's leadership. And our Spirit's leadership, as you see in verse 14, will help us understand and will identify our familiar relationship with God. Notice what Paul says, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So there's the declaration and there's the result if indeed that is us, if we are being led by the Spirit. Now, in order to understand verse 14, we have to understand verse 13, actually 12 and 13, because it's kind of a a, a conclusion or a transition from the first 11 verses. In the first 11 verses, we found here that Paul was talking about the mind and the use of the mind in the Christian experience and how the mind is everything. Because what, what you, how you think determines how you live. And what you think on or who you think on will shape your understanding of everything. Beloved, the Christian life is not about us. It doesn't, Genesis doesn't begin with in the beginning man. It begins with in the beginning God. And we've got to be very careful that we don't think that God becomes our servant or even that divine genie that we ask a whole bunch of stuff and wait for the answer. He is holy, 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 and the mark of the believer is one who walks in his fear. He walks in the fear of God, not afraid of God, but in a healthy respect that shuns sin, that shuns worldliness, and embraces the glorious gospel that is transformational, not only in the sinner, but regularly transformational in the life of the believer. And that's what chapter 8, 1 through 11 is all about. It's about the mind being transformed. And then we find out, well, this is the evidence of that is happening. And the evidence is such that, verse 13, that if you live according to the flesh, that means your mind's not renewed, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And that leads to the interpretation of verse 14. And he would say... That the Spirit leads you only if 13 is true. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And the evidence that you're alive is verse 14. You're led by the Spirit of God. And if you note in verse 13, it's a cooperative effort. It is the Spirit and us. I mean, if you have a besetting sin in your life, and you've prayed, God, please deliver me from this. Please deliver. I'm sure you have. Please deliver me from this. But you don't do anything to put that thing to death. The Spirit is not going to do all that work. You have a cooperative uh, responsibility with the Spirit. He says, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And then in verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. Who leads us to put to death the deeds of the body? It's the Spirit of God. Jeffrey Thomas, he's a Welshman. He's written some good books. This is what he has said, quote, the Spirit leads us not to enable us to escape the difficulties, dangers, trials, or sufferings of this life, but specifically to conquer sin. The Spirit's work is to bring new life to us and clean us up from the inside out, making us holy people. The leading of the Spirit is another phrase for the word sanctification. So we are being led into Christ-like living and constantly restored to Christ-like living when we fall and repent, end quote. So I'll ask you the question. Do you see that the primary purpose in the spirit of the spirit in your life, it's to put to death the deeds of the flesh. It's to kill sin. It's not just to gift you. It's not just to comfort you. It's not, it's none of that. Yes, those are parts of it, but those are not the main thing. Is the Holy Spirit is given so that we would learn how to become more like Christ. 
It's more and more the transformation of his work in us. And that work is in verse 13. It's putting to death the deeds of the body or the deeds of the flesh. And he will lead us, verse 14, into that experience. You can summarize it like this. And, and this, this is way simplistic. I understand that. We could, spend, we could spend a lot of time on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And Pastor Jonathan in the, in the, in the Institute, he's, he's running a systematic theology class. Uh, part two starts in the fall. You're going to cover all that in that. Because one of the deficiencies in the church, we don't understand the Trinity. We do not understand the Godhead. Now, we may think we understand a lot about Jesus and the atonement, but I would say that we're even a little, little, little shallow in our Christology. It's to know more and more about Christ beyond, uh, beyond Savior. And the Fatherhead, uh, we'll talk about the Father later on. But when it comes to the Holy Spirit, I think we're woefully inadequate when it comes to understanding, you know, His work and His person. In fact, there's some people that would call the Holy Spirit an it, as if He has no personality, which is, which is so false. But when it comes to this, this understanding, and again, it's simple. I'm not, and there's no time to uh, launch off on the doctrine of the Trinity. I, I'd love to see us do that. But here's what you, know, you can understand about the Holy Spirit in His leading. He will always lead us to Christ in the opposite of conformity to the world. If you do not put to death the deeds of the, of the body, what are you? You're conforming to the deed, you're conforming to the world, your sinfulness, your sinful nature. So the Holy Spirit will always lead us uh, away from the world and to Christ. And the second thing, the Holy Spirit will always lead us to Christ and away from ourselves is that the Holy Spirit does not concentrate on the believer. The Holy Spirit concentrates on Christ. And if you want to know if you're being led by the Spirit of God, then we're going to see a couple things here. To understand adoption, you have to understand the family. And to understand the family, we need to understand what the Holy Spirit, since He is active in verse 13 and 14, and 15, and 16... If you want to understand his work in this work of adoption, it has to begin by understanding uh, the family nature of those that are adopted or will be, ado- or will be in that family. So what does the... We said who the Spirit of God leads us to. He leads us to Christ. But what family traits? What are the family traits that the Spirit of God wants to produce in us, giving us evidence of adoption? He says adoption here numerous times in this section, first time in Romans. And so if we're going to understand who we are in the family of God, we need to understand what the family traits look like. Well, the first one is this, and I'm going to give you two. The first one is this, is that if the Holy Spirit is is helping us to mortify or put to death the deeds of the flesh, verse 13 then he's leading us, and if he's leading us into an understanding as sons of God, then the first and the chiefest characteristic that should be produced and developed in the life of those in the family would be holiness. Holiness. Does that not make sense? The very thing that God tells us in First Peter is what? Be ye holy as I am holy. And what does Jesus say in the high priestly prayer? He says, Father, sanctify them, make them holy, set them apart. And then you have uh, throughout the exhortations of Scripture, a very serious uh, uh, verse in, in Hebrews, strive for peace and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, Paul would say, take these promises and perfect holiness in the fear of God. Now, this is another area, and I don't want to be negative, but there's another area. I'm not sure we quite understand what holiness is. I mean, if this is what the Holy Spirit wants to do, and he does, and this is the chief characteristic of the children of God, which it is, do we actually know what holiness is? And if your understanding of holiness is just conduct, And just moral conduct that I don't do this, but I do this. If you're you're missing the whole point of what holiness is, holiness is a transformation, an ongoing transformation from the inside out of purity, 
of likeness to Christ. When we get to heaven, what are we going to go to? We're going to a holy place prepared for a holy people to be with a holy God throughout eternity. And so holiness cannot start to be understood as our behavior. You can perform many Christian external activities and not be holy. You can wrap yourself around service and just uh, uh, run yourself ragged doing service and think that's a sign of good Christianity uh, and not be holy. Holiness is not about what you do. It's who you are that produces what you do. And that, once that gets understood, that this is the Spirit of God, He's working within us, one of the, the chief mark of adoption of being a son of God, then that will energize us to do verse 13 even more so, to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Why? Because I want to cooperate with the Spirit in the work that He's leading me to. It makes absolutely no sense for someone to say that they're a Christian, but they don't want to be holy. That's part of the package. It's, it's, I can't take Jesus as my Savior and then live like I want to. You know, what that is, is that, one, that's a false conversion. And number two, it's also false assurance. Is it's not that at all. Is that you get arrested by Christ in similar fashion like the Apostle Paul on the Damascus Road. You get apprehended by the Lord Jesus. And what happens then? That starts this long, painful journey of becoming like him. And uh, becoming like him begins with holiness. Jonathan Edwards said, quote, A true and faithful Christian does not make holy living, living an accidental thing. It is his great concern. As the business of a soldier is to fight, so the business of the Christian is to be like Christ. End quote. It's extremely important how Edwards linked holiness to the likeness of Christ. Friends, always evaluate yourself spiritually, not by someone you see beside you or behind you or ahead of you. And certainly don't evaluate yourself by someone in this pulpit. I, I personally think you have, uh, I think you have two good pastors. At least they want to be. But I also think you have two good pastors that are sinners still. And that we should never be elevated above, you know, the office is what we, we, we keep saying. We don't elevate the man beyond what we are supposed to. Paul says, don't think more highly of yourself than you should. And you shouldn't think more highly of yourself than he, the people here either. Holiness as Edwards would say, is linked with Christ's likeness. And the Spirit of God, as he helps us put to, de put to death the deeds of the flesh, for th verse 13, I think it's fair to ask the question of verse 13, well, why am I putting away these things of the flesh? Well, the answer is, is verse 14, so that I'll be led by the Spirit, so that I'll have the assurance that I am a son of God. Because, friends, if you're not actively in the, in the war of putting to death the sin that besets you, I would, I would argue that you're struggling for assurance. That if you're passive in the warfare, that you're just letting respectable sin, so to speak, and that's not mine, it's Jerry Bridges. If you let that go, and you don't do fight, you don't fight against anger, impatience, complaining, discontent, being unthankful. If you're not fighting against those, you're really probably struggling in your walk with the Lord. So Paul would tell us then that the first thing that, uh, that we see here is that the Spirit leads us. And then we can look from the confirmation of other scripture, where does he lead us? He leads us to Christ. John 16, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will glorify me. He leads us to Christ. And in leading us to Christ, what does he do? He produces within us the characteristics of Christ. You don't make yourself holy. You cooperate with the Spirit as He makes you holy and it's manifested out in your behavior and not just in morality. Well, there's another thing that the Spirit of God wants to do or is doing in the believer. If we are cooperating with Him in verse 13 and putting to death the deeds of the, of the flesh, then we're being led by the Spirit. He's leading us to Christ, away from Himself, which give evidence at the end of verse 14, we're the sons of God. What is the other characteristic that He wants to develop within us? It is love. It is love. We already saw in Romans 5, verse 5, what happens. He said, therefore, being justified by God, we have being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And then a little further down in there, it's 
Paul would write, and the Spirit of God is shed abroad or poured over into you. What? The love of God. The love of God is poured over you in, from the Holy Spirit. Have you understood that? Have I fully understood what Paul is saying? He says, the justified have, has God's Spirit working in them to give them a love and the only source of power to conquer self-love. You can't conquer self-love in the strength of yourself. You can only conquer self-love by a greater love. A greater affection, as Thomas Chalmers would say. And it is a greater affection of God's love poured into your heart, poured into my heart, that allows us to conquer self-love and in turn enables us to love God as we are supposed to and to love one another horizontally. Are there, is there people in your life uh, that are difficult to love? Probably no one in this life has anybody that's difficult to love. Do you? Do you have anybody? I didn't think so, so I'll just talk about me. What do you do? Do you avoid them? It happens even in the church. You may be, in, you may be at, at odds with someone in the church or just, just not synced up. And you'll see that person walk down this aisle and you'll amazingly turn around and go down another aisle. I've seen it. Well, I know I've done it. What do you do when that happens? What do you do when someone hurts you deeply do you understand that the love of God that's been poured out in us as the Spirit of God helps us to defeat the sin of self-love, that we had the resources within us to overcome and actually to love those who have done us great harm? I cannot imagine sitting there at the Last Supper and watching Jesus, let alone wash my dirty feet, but sitting right beside me is Judas. And Judas gets the same treatment as me. Even our enemies deserve the same treatment of those that we are just madly in love with. And the only way you can do that is if, verse 13 and 14, is if you understand the role of the Spirit to help you put to death self of love so that you can be, under, be filled with Christ's love. And when you're filled with Christ's love, you know what the goal is of the Christian life? It's 2 Corinthians 5, 14, to be controlled by that love. God does not pour his love into our hearts by the Spirit just for us to be hoarders and enjoyment of that love. Everything that you have from God, everything that I have from God is to be used and I am to be a conduit of blessings to others. There's no hoarders in the Christian life. What do we have that we did not receive? And the answer is nothing. Nothing. And so when I'm filled with God's love, when he pours his love out in me by the Spirit who has helped me to defeat self-love and by justification I have that, I don't need to pray, God, give me love for that person that hurt me deeply. No, I need to say, God, thank you for the love that you've given me already so that I can love that person that has hurt me deeply. You know what that is? That is an exercise of faith in what God has already promised you. And now your responsibility is to walk under the leadership of the Spirit, verifying that you are a, a, fan, a family member of God, and you go to that person, and you love that person. It's amazing uh, when we understand that God's love is not given to us just to comfort us. God's love is given to us so that we will be those messengers of love to others. And it's a message of love that doesn't just go out there first. Jesus says in John 13, 34 and 35, he says this very thing, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. Now, what in the, what's important about those verses, or that verse, is we're not allowed to determine who we love. And we're not allowed to determine what it looks like. I can't define what this love is. The definition of it and the example of it is what Jesus says. You are to love one another and don't look around and don't go anywhere else. You look at me. Just as I have loved you. Can you imagine the disciples hearing that? 
they would have had to think all the times that Jesus displayed love to people. They lived with love walking in the flesh. And so they would have had to look there. And so what does the Spirit of God, I already said earlier, what does He do? He leads us to Christ. So when you want to find that you can't love this person, you need to get along with God and say, God, you've already given me the love to do this. I need your Spirit to lead me so that I can love. Love with a love that I don't have in and of myself. And you don't know that you reciprocating love when you were given hatred will not be the very means that draws that person to Christ. And so what's the application on this first thing of the Holy Spirit, his first work of, of affirming to us our adoption or identity? The first thing that he does is that he tells us that by cooperating with the Spirit, putting to death the deeds of the body, we're in a position to be led by the Spirit. And as being led by the Spirit, we come, we come to extend this, what is his work in us of leading? He leads us to Christ to produce within us the traits of the family, and that is holiness and of love. And the application is simply, are we putting to death the deeds of the body? Because we can't get to 14, 15, 16, and 17 unless we're doing 13. And we can't do 13 unless we understand that verses 1 through 11 is about your mind. What are you renewing your mind with? But if we're, if we're walking through that and we find that the Word is shaping our mind, not the world, then we're in a position here to be led by the Spirit because we are putting to death the deeds of the flesh. And as such, then we learn that He's developing holiness within us. And within us is a holiness that leads to love that gives us the assurance at the end of verse 14 that we are indeed the sons of God. Well, what else do we see in verse 14? We see the family identified. We see the family identified or declared, and that is the sons of God or the children of God. This has occurred uh, throughout Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 15, 16, and 17. Sons of God, children of God, children. And there's a lot to be said about this. And that lot to be said, Lord willing, will have to be for another day. So as, as you go through this, and you think about adoption. Learn to be what it means. Learn, learn what it means to be in the family of God. Learn that primarily you're in the family of God, not to escape the wrath of God, but to have family traits formed within you. Is to grow in the likeness of the one who gave his life so that you could be in the family. And these family traits, their holiness and their love. And so that's a good way you can evaluate yourself as a Christian. Hey, I'm in the family of God. We sing that song, how wonderful it is to be in the family of God. But then say, well, wait a minute. What does it mean to be in the family of God? My mom and dad uh, used to tell me growing up, son, when I was, I was going out, they would always say, son, remember your name. And uh, I said, well, that's kind of weird. I, I know my name. And they said, no. Remember your last name, who you represent. Don't bring tarnish. Or, or an ill reputation against your name. And so I remember going around all the time, I'd run into older people. They said, oh, I know your parents. I know, I know them. They're good people. And I really felt that there was a responsibility not to bring tarnish upon their reputation. It's the same thing with us. Is that we are to progress in holiness and progress in love so that as the Spirit of God works these in us, we have the assurance that we're in the family of God. And remember, you bear the name Christian. You bear the name of Christ. And the world needs to see from us family traits. It'll have an impact. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your, your tremendous love and your patience and your kindness. And we so honor you for putting us in your family. And Lord, thank you for the practical illustrations and practical applications from Paul's letter that truly... If we put to death the deeds of the flesh, the deeds of the body, in the power of the Spirit, then we'll recognize His leadership. And His leadership will take us to Christ. And in taking to Christ and developing holiness and love, we will have the assurance, the affirmation that we're in the family. And Lord, if there's someone here who's not in the family, please, please open their hearts and their minds 
to see their sin, to see a waiting Savior. May you grant them repentance. May you grant them faith. And may soon we see them follow in believers' baptism. And we rejoice, Father, in who you are and what you're doing among us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.